Welcome to episode 63 of the Data Driven Strength Podcast. This is take two. We started off on an inappropriate note, so we are starting from scratch here. But we can repeat the fact that we are both wearing purple shirts. Zach's shirt says we're all going to die, so we're starting with facts here on the Data Driven Strength Podcast. Um, Zach, what's new and exciting in your world before we uh, we kick off this podcast here? Got some pickleball on the docket later today. Excited to uh, really get after it. Every time I play, I hurt something else. So I'm excited to see what um, what muscle gets tweaked this time. I'm really looking forward to uh, a Pop Lydia strain or something cool. Um, I'm sure that's going to be the reason that holds my performance back, not because I am not skilled. Yeah, pick, pickleball is a lot of fun. Pickleball is a lot of fun. Um, I did in, I think this was high school, I went on a bit of a tennis stint. It was a lot of fun, but I've tried playing since then, and it's just it's really hard to kind of get back in the groove. You got to do it regularly. So pickleball is a nice in, be- in between for sure. But if you had to pick, would you only play ping pong for the rest of your life, or would you only play pickleball for the rest of your life? I think I'm going ping pong. Ping pong buried entries lower. Um, can play way more. I'm just thinking about many of. Uh, social you can gatherings your old I've been, age. been to and you're just absolutely getting it on the ping pong table for like two or three hours like a massive tournament um yeah, yeah old age yeah I, I just think pickleball i mean uh ping pong is just more more uh yeah you got more finesse on it more spins more options you know you could just flex a little harder with pick, uh, ping pong i think so I, that's final answer lock it in yeah i think it's funny you say that because pickleball is like you know kind of a retirement sport um, but I guess you can, your ping pong lifespan is a little bit longer than your, uh, pickleball lifespan. So fair answer. I think, I think, uh, I'd have to go with ping pong as well, just for the memes. Um, played it so much growing up and it's something I can pick up and I feel like hold my own against almost anyone. What's, uh, what's the game called where after you lose ping pong, you, the other person gets to hit it at your bare back as hard as I can. What's that called? Uh, I don't, I don't know. Did you play I, that? No, I guess I was, I, oh. I guess I was a try hard because we, yeah. we, we just played endless tournaments. You know, you'd be like, oh, all right, dude. let's play three out of five and then you'd lose. And it's like, no, let's play four out of seven. Yeah, no, that was, uh, uh, I think that decreased my, uh, my ping pong playing quite a bit when I was younger. Cause that was the, <laughs> that was the token. If you lost, is exactly. I think, I think, I think that's bullying. <laughs> I think that's bullying. Um, on my end, I have. It is July in South Florida. It is hot. It is humid. I've recently gotten my AC back in order, so it's been a rough week. Um, luckily, or unluckily, I don't know. No, I think luckily because it's kind of gotten me out of out of my house more. Um, getting rolling with my dissertation data collection, and I'm learning a lot about individual differences in calf anatomy because that is the muscle that I am I am measuring and I'm measuring both the lateral and the medial gastroc and it is very interesting how different folks are in terms of basically I guess uh, for lack of a scientific explanation how wide each head of the gastroc is. So I've had some folks where their medial gastroc is like way wider than their lateral. And I've had some folks where it's, it's the other way around. So it's been very interesting. Um, I've gotten a, uh, uh, I've seen a lot of calves feel good about measuring the calves though, because as long as you kind of individualize where that point is and you take notes on it and you're consistent, should be some really good measurements. Um, but I'll be very clear about those measurements because I get frustrated looking in papers, trying to learn about previous methods. And it's like, Hey, we did it 25% of the way down the lower leg using whatever landmarks, but it's like, okay, that's like the first step of like five or six steps in measuring uh, muscle size. So, um, I'm just going on a tangent now, Zach, I don't know if you have any, any input. No, I think, I, I think, uh, um, ultrasound methods and just that whole tangent is a whole podcast of in itself that we should do sometime. Um, that, that is a, this is a little nugget for podcast listeners, but that to me is one of the, there's like a Mount Rushmore of best kept secrets in strength and hypertrophy research. And I think ultrasound 
methods and variability and um, just how many things can go wrong with ultrasound is one of them. Um, and I think that that would be, yeah, that, that's a, that's a cool podcast episode just to go into kind of go through your process that you had to go through in pilot testing and determining all those things. And then my mm-hmm. experience of um, all the, the stuff that I did with my dissertation, which I took um, uh, like a modified muscle thickness and then a cross-sectional area measurement of the quads. Learned a lot through that as well, that um, similar to kind of the things you found in pilot testing, things I'd probably do different now, things like that. Um, so yeah, don't want to go too far on that tangent, but that's an interesting concept that I think deserves more discussion and probably a little bit more transparency as you uh, just mentioned. Yeah, especially when it's like, you're, yeah, if you're extrapolating and making broad sweeping claims about a study, like, for example, we've alluded to in recent episodes, some of the studies looking at the relationship between changes in muscle size and changes in muscle strength. The first thing I'm doing is looking at the ultrasound methods. And I'm not, I'm not saying there's any specific papers that come to mind or like any lab groups or, or you know, kind of that have studied that area or doing things quote unquote wrong. I just think it's an area for improvement because I've gone to look for those things because I'm like, I think this is really important for the research question. I'm like, I don't, I, I couldn't repeat that. Like, I don't know exactly what happened here. And I think it's really important for the research question. Uh, one that comes to mind is the, uh, actually, no, I'm not even going to name drop that study because I can't think of the ultrasound methods off the top of my head and I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. But, um, yeah, it's, it's important and it's interesting. Uh, at this point I've measured the calves, the biceps and the triceps for studies that I've spearheaded. Um, and then I've been around for the quads and the pecs as well. I think that's everything. And I definitely understand why people typically choose the quads and the biceps. Those are the easiest triceps and I'd say calves are next and then triceps are definitely the hardest in in my opinion when i measured the triceps i had to individualize things a lot right so at pre-testing I'd, i had to say okay what do i want to measure how do i make sure i get that given you know some people's like just uh individual differences in their insertions and the anatomy of the the different heads of the triceps and then you also have considerations with how much subcutaneous fat they have as well that can make things tricky um you know what probe am i using etc and it's kind of it can take a lot of time and i don't know i just like when i when i when i learned all these methods and like you said did pilot testing so you feel good going into the study it's like this this is important i don't know why it's not in these manuscripts so um hopefully we'll we'll do a a good job of, of reporting what we do but anyway that's a that's probably a whole podcast for another time. So we have a couple questions lined up. I don't know if we'll call this a Q&A episode. Um, maybe we'll just answer one. Maybe we'll answer both. But Zach, I'll kick it to you to ans- to ask that first question, and then I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Sure thing. So, I mean, the most important part of the question is who asked it. And we got um, a question from Mr. Woozy Pawsies. <laughs> That's, uh, what do you think that's like alluding to? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I like I, pause like on a dog. Yeah, I've, I've ventured not to to uh, speculate too much. Or, or, or are we missing something in plain sight? Yeah, that's. Uh, you know what I'm saying. I, I have a feeling there's probably. I have a feeling we're missing something. Yeah, there's probably. We live something. on. We kind of live under a rock, man. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so anyway, this user asked, uh, or not user, this uh, listener asked. Um, so you mentioned novelty in a, uh, in programming being a potential influence on strength gains in one of your recent episodes. I'd love to hear more elaboration studies on this that you come to mind or even how you'd approach it, um, when designing a study within itself. Um, we thought this was a good question. Obviously, Josh, this is like a area that's near and dear to your heart. Um, the area of novelty as this is, uh, one of the kind of areas that is particularly relevant for your PhD. Um, so yeah, what do you think about that? What, uh, what comes to mind? You think of novelty area studies that have been, um, kind of triangulating that area and just kind of what, how do you view it in general? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of directions we can take this. Um, let me start with something that's very basic and I think pretty straightforward. 
if I were to take a cohort of 100 people and have them do a given resistance training protocol, I expect them, I, I expect the average response to be pretty robust for a given amount of time. Um, probably something around a linear response. If I let's say I were to measure strength or hypertrophy um, every single week. I'd expect a pretty linear response for maybe 10 ish weeks. I, obviously, that's, you know, don't take that to the bank, but then we're going to start seeing some pretty meaningful diminishing returns, and those diminishing returns are only going to accelerate, right? And that reflects what we see in a training career. When you start training well, um, you see robust responses, and then you see diminishing returns, and those diminishing returns kind of only accelerate um, all things held equal. So the question with novelty is like, can we adjust the magnitude of the stimulus and or the nature of the stimulus to potentially attenuate some of those diminishing returns? So this is this kind of circles in on a concept that is more or less the focus of, of my PhD, which is resensitization. So if we think of that basic example of my cohort of 100 people doing the same resistance training program, and we see diminishing returns over time, that would be um, desensitization, right? So they are sensitized to the stimulus at the start, and then they become less and less sensitive, they become less and less responsive, and that is desensitization. So the question with novelty is, can we adjust some things in order to resensitize the muscle to either the same stimulus or a new stimulus? The short answer, man, is, is we don't have a whole lot of research to go off of here. And I think it, it's pretty striking to me how little we have to go off of here, given how wide ranging it is. And if you really listen closely, some of the assumptions baked in to programming and periodization models that rely on this concept. Um, Renaissance periodization, for example, they have kind of popularized this adding sets model. And I don't want to like explain it for them because that's not my place. Um, and th to their credit, they've also kind of evolved it over time. And I'm also not making a, ju a judgment station, uh, excuse me, a judgment statement on it right now. I actually think it's, it's pretty enticing um, for, for hypertrophy solely. But again, just to kind of boil it down and they have a paper in, I think it's strength and conditioning journal where they, yeah, basically suggest starting with lower volumes and also higher RARs and then decreasing the RAR across a mesocycle. So over the course of say four to eight, 12 weeks, something like that. And also adding sets. Again, this is oversimplified. I know that they're pretty big on auto-regulating set volume as well, but let's just kind of think of that in general, and we don't even have to associate it with any particular person or, or company. I think that resensitization is absolutely vital to some of the, um, the assumptions that underlie that. Because basically what you're saying is, I don't need to get to the highest volume that I can tolerate right away because I'm more, I'm, I'm more sensitive to training because I'm coming off of a deload. I don't need to jump back in into say 15 sets of chest. I can just start with eight and then build up to 15, right? Because I'm more sensitive to that training stimulus, um, coming off of the deload. And I'm pretty sure I've heard Dr. Mike Israel say that before is like, yeah, you could jump into failure training in week one, but you don't need to because you're more sensitive. Again, I'm not trying to put words in his mouth, but I think people are pretty familiar with him and, and his methods. Um, so that's an example of like assumptions that go into it. And to be clear, I'm not saying I, I agree or disagree with that. Um, I'm very interested in getting more data on it. Um, and then also a lot of periodization, especially for powerlifters or folks that have multiple training goals. So team sport athletes, um, you know, a lot of block periodization is kind of built under the assumption that if you take some time maintaining a specific attribute um, or the training contributing to that attribute and you up the dose that you're going to see an accelerated response compared to if you were to just train that consistently. 
right? Um, I think the way that some people just frame deloads in general, the way that people frame progression in general, again, kind of, I think it kind of underlies a ton of things and we just have very little data on it. I will name drop a couple studies. The first study that I'll mention is a study that, gosh darn it, why is the lead author escaping me right now? It's the volume cycling study where they took time off, Zach. Ogasawara. Thank you. Gosh. Ogasawara. Um, fantastic study. So basically they had one group that trained for 24 weeks straight. The other group trained for six, six three. weeks, three weeks off, six weeks, three weeks off, six weeks, right? And they took hypertrophy and strength measurements at kind of the beginning and end of each of those like six or three week phases. And what you see is that when that cycled volume group um, returned to training, they did see an accelerated response. So they absolutely saw resensitization. So in my view, resensitization is definitely a thing. However, they also lost muscle, right? So during that three week detraining period, they lost muscle. So kind of the fundamental question that I'm looking to answer for my, my PhD and just that I think remains um, unclear in the research is, is that just them regaining lost muscle? So in other words, can we resensitize our muscles to a stimulus in the absence of atrophy or in the absence of muscle loss? That we just don't know. And this is an important thing to recognize or an important thing to understand, I think, because Again, I think it has a ton of implications, a pretty wide ranging implications. If it, if resensitization without atrophy is a thing, then I think, you know, there's great reason to not do super high volumes if you're just did training that, or you did, you're, if you're coming off of a deload or a reduced training volume period, you should just kind of milk that and, and slowly build up. Whereas if resensitization, without atrophy is not a thing, then it's really just a logistical game of how do I kind of pack in the stimulus within logistical constraints, making sure like soreness or isn't extremely high or um, injury risk isn't, you know, amplified because I'm spiking the workload. Um, and then there's also implications for powerlifting, which I'll, I'll spare, spare us a few minutes there of diving into. There's I'd say the strongest evidence for it is a study from Carvalho and colleagues. Um, don't hold me to these exact numbers, but from what I recall, both groups trained for like six to eight weeks or so with um, eight to 12 RM loads. So nice quality hypertrophy training. And then one of those groups took a training block where they just did one to three RM training. So set volume was the same, but it's probably worse hypertrophy training. And during that period, the other group continued to train with H12 RM loads. And the, the group that kind of did that more strength bias training with one to three RM loads, they did see worse hypertrophy during that time period. But then that group that did the strength training returned to H12 RM loads and kind of saw slightly accelerated hypertrophy and actually ended up at a slightly higher nominal point in terms of net hypertrophy over time. But man, it's it's one study. Um, you know, it's been reanalyzed by by multiple folks, and and whether or not it's statistically significant in terms of that resensitization effect is very much up in the air. And we've mul we've discussed multiple times how one study is uh, helpful, but um, you know, isn't going to seal the deal by any means. So that's where I'm at with novelty and there's so many other things we could discuss, such as changing the training stimulus whether there's something there, but I'll, I'll give it a rest and see what you think, Zach. That, that was going to be my main follow-up just because I know you've thought about this a ton. Is like, so you mentioned a couple different cases in which this is usually applied in, in the field. So, you know, you have the case that you mentioned from periodization of team sports, periodization from powerlifting, um, you know, the kind of the more traditional example from the hypertrophy training world, the, thing that's causing the resensitization there is kind of different in every case. Do you have any intuitions on if one variable is more linked to that than another? 
Is it multiple things? Is it the fact that I'm changing repetition ranges? Does that count as resensitization or novelty to the extent that I would expect that to accelerate my progress? Um, how does how does changing exercises factor in? I know I hear people say, um, you know, if you stall out on a certain movement, rotate exercises as a way to get new progress again. So I, I guess to, to boil my question down to be more specific is ultimately like from your mechanistic kind of speculation ultimately um because we are you know just missing a ton of data on this but i'm just curious kind of what you think um do you think there is a single training variable that really mediates this or is it one of these things where everything kind of plays some role um, from a novelty aspect i guess i'll i'll specifically make that from a physiological perspective i can absolutely see where all kinds of training variables could be considered um, like novelty inducing and potentially spurs up progress if it increases motivation, if it increases effort from like a psychological perspective, I'm more so interested in the kind of the muscle centric effects, if that makes sense. Yeah. Oh man. I, I, I wish I had some kick-ass answer for you that, um, you know, just, you know, really impressed the listener, but Honestly, I've, I've gone back and forth on it. Just if, if I were to like take a guess, um, and I, I kind of see myself doing similar things that you did along the path of, you know, thinking through your dissertation topics, starting the data collection, thinking more and more about it, having more more conversations, um, kind of thinking through that lens when you're coaching people, etc. Um, so I, I I see it changing. What I'll say is that. I think it's probably all or nothing is my best guess is that like resensitization as a whole is either a thing or it's not really a thing again in the absence of muscle atrophy like I described earlier. So in other words, I think that it's unlikely that you have like resensitization you have you you one day have evidence for resensitization in terms of just the magnitude of the dosage and then you have the opposite finding in terms of like the type of dosage whether that's rep range exercise selection etc because like to me it's kind of the same thing in a way like if i change from exercise a to exercise b even with the same dosage in whatever way we quantify that using sets, RIR, some combination of, of the two, like it is still a different stimulus and thus the, uh, I guess, cellular upregulation and where that's occurring is a change in the magnitude of the stimulus if you really boil it down to like its fundamental units. And I think you could say kind of a similar thing for rep ranges that one gets a little bit tricky just because we know so little about like how a set of five and a set of 30 could lead to the same whole muscle growth like i'm still skeptical of a lot of the the assumptions baked into baked into that um but if, if i if i had to give you an answer right now i think it's kind of all or nothing um like it's either this is a thing or it's not and it wouldn't differ in terms of magnitude versus type of stimulus here, here's my half-baked idea, and you tell me if I'm crazy. So I've kind of been – I've long probably made the annoying case that you need to cut volume. I remember making a webinar about back in the day um, for IP um, users about resensitization stuff, and I, I've – from the data that I've like kind of based this upon, we've really only seen it from the atrophy perspective to multiple weeks of training cessation, if I'm correct on that. So my half-baked idea has been training cessation is the most extreme form of dosage reduction that you can possibly do. So if anything, that seems to be a variable that does seem to be linked to resensitization. And then from the positive training adaptations that we do have, particularly for hypertrophy, which is what we're kind of mostly basing this off of at the moment, they seem to be a little bit less relevant. So, you know, rep range is the one that comes to mind there. Like most things all, all held equal. 
like you said, there's some, there's some question marks around like the ultra structural, you know, nature of some of these things, but on the whole muscle level, for the most part, you'd say it doesn't seem to matter a whole ton, uh, as long as proximity to failure is equated. So my kind of half-baked idea has been that things that reduce the dosage at a given fiber level, probably are the things that matter. So obviously volume is the biggest player there. Exercise selection does make sense in my head because essentially from a regional perspective, you're reducing or increasing the dosages depending on the, um, the, you know, the joint angle resistance profile, everything that you're training. So I think that could have some efficacy in like kind of a roundabout way. And then rep ranges, while I don't think they have a direct effect and proximity to failure kind of is an interaction with this as well. From some of the other research in the Plotkin papers, the one we've talked about a few times, I think rep range does influence mechanics of exercises that um, uh, that allow for that. So like just different degrees of freedom. So like your free weight exercises, your you know dumbbell exercises, things like that. I just think that the mechanics that you utilize with lighter loads are different than what you use with heavy loads. And I think that can have a similar effect, although on a much smaller scale to exercise selection, essentially. So I think to me, those all kind of come back to a similar principle about the dosage kind of being changed marginally. Um, So that's where my head goes. And I think that's, you know, not to spoil your PhD. That's the one I think you'd probably put the most stock in based on your study design. (laughs) But, um, but yeah, it's, it's uh, the dosage. Yeah, just like dosage yeah. in general, it kind of being the, the biggest player. Yeah. Um, you didn't choose rep range to be the thing to to focus on, right? Yeah. if it, Dude, if, if it is a thing, like it'd have to be such a small effect that it would be hard to detect. So, yeah. So, so that's, that's kind of my half big theory in terms of like how that stuff plays a role is like all these anecdotes that people have in terms of novelty being a thing, I think in a roundabout way or another when you remove the psychological things off the table, which obviously are important parts of training in the long term, maintaining effort, all that kind of stuff. But if you're looking at it from more from a muscle centric perspective, it seems to be the largest contributor probably is some sort of dosage related thing where, yeah. you know, you can only cram in so much training in a given week. And ultimately that's got to go somewhere. And there's probably some areas that are being um, neglected more than others. And if resensitization is a thing, you can probably bias that in different directions to maybe get a greater net total sum in the end. Um, But it's, it's one of those questions that, like you said, it's pretty damn important. We don't have that much data on it. Um, The Agusawara paper is so good and there really hasn't been a follow-up to it. Um, That's just unfortunate. Like MRI measurements, a decent amount of, you know, decent time period. Um, Training program is pretty solid. Like, you know, (laughs) really everything you want. Uh, I think sample size is decent if I recall. Um, so yeah, whole, whole nine yards and I'm excited to kind of see where your PhD goes. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it too. And I want to emphasize that we are discussing this up to this point in this episode, primarily from a muscle centric view, because that's, that's the role of research in my view. Um, at least I don't want to say the role of research. That's where I think research is the most helpful to us is to say, how does these given inputs, and in this case, kind of the the relative inputs compared to what you were doing previously, how does that influence how muscle responds? Um, because even if we find no evidence of resensitization, I'll probably still volume cycle like to some degree, but I might do it less. I might do it in different scenarios and I might do it for different reasons. Um, so for example, I... Like, it's just, it, I'm still going to deload. Like, I, I I have a hard time even visualizing a body of research that suggests deloads don't improve strength outcomes. Like, I don't know if there's enough studies that could stop me from doing deloads in practice when I think they're necessary, you know? Um, yeah, it just, it might change your perspective on why you're doing it. And that might influence like the frequency, like you said, like if, exactly. if let's, let's just say theoretically the deal loads are entirely for psychological reasons that would probably change and view them more as like psychological pit stops rather than something you're using very, you know, regimentedly to like try to make sure fatigue stays at bay for a given period of time. Right. Something like that. Yeah. That, that was very well put or, um, 
man, I, I want to say the term accumulated fatigue, but sometimes I, I kind of hesitate as to whether fatigue can actually accumulate in the way that people, a lot of people talk about it, but let's just use that term. Or if it's just, you know, a way to kind of quote unquote, wipe the slate clean so that your technique feels a little bit better because a lot of times, um, lower fatigue levels seem to just allow you to grease the groove a little bit better, right? Do a nice clean taper for someone show up in the warm up room. And they're like, man, it's so easy to get to this bottom of the squat or, um, man, the bar's just jumping off my chest. Um, just that can set things up for the next block to be more exciting. Again, that's kind of a, an indirect psychological effect or allows you to use slightly heavier loads, even though like the actual machinery within the muscle and how it responds to tension isn't resensitizing, you still might use some of these strategies again for different reasons. So I think that was very well put. Um, and like I've, I've seen, or I, th I think I've seen this concept like play out enough in practice that like I take it seriously. I take the potential of it occurring seriously. Um, it's just so hard because there's so many confounders. Like the la the last time I saw meaningful muscle growth in like really any muscle I can think about on my body was when I, I push the volumes higher and it's like, you could kind of spin that to be resensitization, but is it just like the magnitude of the dosage? I don't know. Um, here's a, here's an anecdote so that tricky. I'm curious to see if you, if you can throw at it, uh, an explanation that I haven't thought of the strongest evidence in my coaching experience I've had for resensitization is rates of progress. When people get hurt that mm. far exceed on lower volumes, mm typically more conservative training interventions that far exceed their pre-training strength. And I've seen that but it, ha a handful of times. I, I, I have too, but is that just dosage? So like, that's just a more appropriate dosage for them so, for okay, practical so, reasons that allows them to perform well for training, thus expose themselves to heavy enough loads. So, okay. To so that, that, that's, that's ultimately where you're coming at it from. So you're basically yeah, saying, yeah. okay, this person gets hurt. Um, the dosage they were doing, before, well, I guess, I guess the confounder, I guess I'm saying is that essentially they get back to the same training intervention and then mm. for a while extended period of time following the injury the progress is okay. at a faster rate to the extent that they PR. So person does training intervention that they're making progress. They're doing well, random injury okay. occurs. You know, you could say that might be slightly too aggressive a training intervention. Sure. Whatever. Um, they get, they get injured. We work them back up to a similar, very similar training intervention they were doing beforehand because they were making progress. Now that rate of progress that is exceeding their normal rate of progress is maintained to the extent that they hit all-time PRs, like pretty, pretty moderate term after the injury. That's like, those are the couple times I've seen it where I'm just like, this is hard to explain other than what resensitization would kind of be expected is, is yeah. you know, in my experience. Yeah, I agree that that anecdote is like pretty convincing. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of similar situations and usually where it really piques my interest is when you're building back up after a tweak or, or whatever, or some sort of setback. And you're like, wow, progress is really good. Oh, wow, we're back to PR levels. Oh, wow, we just PR'd and we're doing we're half doing of what 50%. we were doing before. Yeah. That's, that's, that's more so where I go with it. But again, your, I think your example is, would be a pretty strong case for resensitization. This is super unscientific, but like also coming back from a little bit of time off and just like how it wanted to get after it, want, like wanting to get after it psychologically, but just like the pumps, man can be so good when you get back to training after a little bit of time off. Um, I'm thinking of one of my clients in particular. Being able to go uh, he, up and load every week on your top sets just for a little bit, like that kind of stuff. Yeah. And again, there's so many confounders there because you probably did take a step back in terms of where you, your entry point. Um, but I, I mentioned one of my clients that just like, he's one of those guys that has a really hard time, like feeling his chest in any sort of like pressing exercise. And, you know, we, we've played around with a ton of stuff, exercise selection, length and partials, had some success there. Then he went on vacation, he came back and he was like, wow, like this like I've never felt my pecs like this, like they're cramping. 
nothing changed except for the fact that just took a little bit of a little bit of time off. Um, and I'm like, huh, maybe we should strategically do that. Maybe the muscle does, you know, just kind of get so desensitized and then we kind of it's another uh, another reintroduce uh, it. Ramble that similar topic is momentum. I still think that that is also a thing. And I just like, can't, mm-hmm. like, like why, why should we, if, if heavier loads are better for strength and conceptual, let's say somebody could tolerate singles at eight all the time. Why do that instead of, or why not do that instead of single at five, six, seven, nine in a block, right? Like yeah. it, just in my experience, the momentum is definitely also a thing, but I have essentially zero physiological rationale for why that's the case. <laughs> I, I couldn't agree more. Like that's, that was probably the, there, there's like a handful of things that I've changed in terms of how I just go about programming and coaching for the average person. And that's one of them is when I just either encourage people to change the psychological approach to workouts and, and or specific sets based on where they're at in the block or just change the RP a lot. Right. It's like I, I used to program more statically. Okay. Single at eight, the entire block. But now it's like, hey, single at four to five. Let's f- get that entry point. Let's get get the momentum going. Single at five to six. Single at six to seven. Maybe a higher peak at the end of the block. They're really excited for that. They they're not going into the week totally beat up. They felt that they they saw the load on the bar go up every week. Like again, I at least within I guess kind of the systems that I use. Like that's just been a, a game changer. And yeah, um, there's so many uh, other factors there that could be contributing. And resensitization is is one of them. Um, one thing I will say about resensitization is I think if if applied knowing that it might not be a thing at all, like if you apply it correctly, some of these volume cycling things or workload cycling sort of approaches or r- workload ramping approaches, if you apply it, again, I'll just say right, which I know isn't super helpful, I think it can be a neutral to a positive, Okay. So if you if you go take a month off in the name of resensitization, you're not applying it right. But if you're like, hey, I'm going to lean into the fact that this person is on vacation and doesn't really like to train on vacation. So I'll just say, hey, try to get some some push ups and some split squats in. Um, and, you know, maybe we'll we'll get a little resensitization effect or they like training for strength, even though their main goal is hypertrophy. OK, let's let's do a lower rep block and you know, kind of lean into that a little bit. And we're not going to make the hypertrophy stimulus zero, but we could, again, potentially get a neutral to a positive effect. So I'm really interested in this concept and I'm excited. Hopefully, you know, my data or I, our data, um, our in terms of, of the lab collectively, our data provides some insight. Hopefully we get some more insight in the coming years. I'm excited about no matter which, way it leans down the road. If resensitization is a thing, like the nerdy side of me really gets excited in terms of like ways to apply that, additional research questions. If we don't have strong evidence for resensitization, we just lean more and more into these practical things as opposed to these physiological nitty gritty mechanisms and super fancy periodization schemes. And we say, hey, it really comes down to the stimulus and what's practical. And it's also okay for things to kind of bounce around a little bit. It's okay if you, you know, don't hit the exact desired workload every single week and you do a little more because you had more time or you do a little less because you didn't have as much time. Um, so I'm excited about either end of the, the fence that this ends up on. Awesome. That was a good episode. I, I enjoyed that. Should I we, think that's, uh, should we good. give a couple practical things? I, f- I feel like this was pretty in the clouds. Man, I, yeah, I, I guess um, it's kind of hard with this topic. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, honestly, at the same time, like I kind of feel like that's what the podcast is for. Um, this is it's fair. Yeah, I, I feel like it's for uh, kind of just uh, talking shop, thinking about some of these things, and I think the the listeners enjoy kind of uh, talking through it. But I guess if you had to, let's say you had a listener that is interested in trying to get some of these neutral to positive effects out of resensitization. What are one to three points of execution you would give them to make sure that they're potentially getting the benefits, but also not screwing themselves over. Okay. Yeah. I like that framing. So if you're training for hypertrophy, 
enjoy leaning into higher workloads for muscles you're excited to train. Like I see very little downside to do that. So long as you're not like dropping the other, like you're dropping other muscles considerably, if that makes sense. So like, I wouldn't put everything else on maintenance and just blast chest in the name of specialization, but Hey, I'm, I'm pretty stoked for whatever reason to grow my chest for the next couple months. Cool. Like lean into that and push the volumes on there. I probably do like two or three muscles at a time. You just kind of cycle through that. Um, that's what I personally do. I really enjoy it right now. I'm specializing arms. I've been doing it for, uh, a couple weeks. I, before that I was specializing delts and back before that I was specializing, um, quads. And I think the, at least the way I've been doing it and that way I described is like a neutral to slightly positive effect. And psychologically I enjoy it. Cause I'm like, I'm really excited to you know, prioritize these change my weekly setup to kind of bias that and then, um, you know, change it up kind of once that gets stale. My second action item would be more on the strength side. And that would be, you can kind of do a similar thing with a given lift. So you can say, Hey, we're going to allocate a little bit more resources to either squat or deadlift. Um, that's typically the one that I found the most success with. Obviously you could do it for bench. Um, but that doesn't seem to take away from squat and deadlift beyond just like time considerations. Um, or if you have someone that's interested in both strength and hypertrophy, I really like to give those folks like the option, Hey, we're going to do some upper back, some delt, some arm work, maybe some calf work, some ab work. Is there any of those that you're interested in kind of biasing or specializing in? And we can kind of prioritize it. Um, and then deloads, I just deloads and wave loading, primarily wave loading. I, I just have found so much more success with than more static approaches. Resensitization might kind of play a, a small role in that. So it would be, you know, starting more chill early in the block and then having kind of an unsustainable week at the end of the block um, is, is the way that I like to go about it. And then the last thing I would say is hopefully this discussion encourages you to think critically about how you're managing workload or some of these other variables that you theoretically could resensitize to. And gives you like a slightly more critical eye when thinking about it. Specifically that if it is a thing, it's not going to be like a massive thing. And you don't need to like, hi, like if you're training for hypertrophy, you don't need to go do three months of strength training to go get the most out of your, your subsequent hypertrophy work. It's definitely like a that's secondary just taking consideration. It it's a secondary consideration from the main variables driving the outcome of interest. Right. And if it, helps you drive up the main variables. So for hypertrophy, volume, and proximity to failure, awesome. If for strength, it allows you to train with heavier loads or, or slightly more volume, awesome. But if it's taking away from those over a long term, then you should think twice about it because it's, it's secondary, just like Zach said. So hopefully those are some takeaways that are, are helpful and um, bring it back down to earth a little bit. Beautiful. That's a great way to wrap up. Um, as always, please leave us a five-star rating on the podcast and let us know if you want us to tackle any more questions. Uh, we regularly leave Q&A boxes on our Instagram stories, so be sure to look out for those. And we always have kind of a Rolodex of questions to answer. A couple of these came from, or th this question came from one of those Q&A questions, so be sure to continue to let us know what you want to hear us discuss. And we will see you on the next episode. Thanks for tuning in.